All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Energy Zones Mapping Tool demo. And today's topic will be energy planning and climate change. Um, so uh, there's quite a bit of different, um, there are quite a bit of different capabilities in the tool. And uh, it's hard to really uh, cover uh, much of that in one demonstration, but um, we try to change topics and um, there's been some recent um, data and a report added for climate change, so I just want to go over those new enhancements. So uh, a very brief uh, introduction about the website and project in general. Um, the Energy Zones Mapping Tool originally uh, was developed for the Eastern Interconnection States Planning Council. And it was a collaborative effort between three national laboratories listed there. Um, Argonne, where I work um, and where we host the tool, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, we got a lot of help um, from those two other laboratories, in particular subject matter expertise about different power plant models and siting factors, as well as a lot of um, assistance in locating data sets that were very helpful. Uh, the ICEPIC organization, uh, that's just our way of pronouncing that, that acronym. Um, it's, if you look at the map at the upper right, uh, their jurisdiction is the uh, U.S. portion of the Eastern Interconnection. And um, the Interconnection itself includes, actually ICEPIC extends to Canada as well. Um, so all those Eastern states as well as some of the sub-jurisdictions within it, and then um, six Canadian provinces. Um, the organization is comprised of public utility commissions, governor's offices, uh, and state energy offices. Uh, most of the participants are involved in um, either managing um, power uh, grids or uh, doing energy planning or policy for the respective states. And original funding was provided by uh, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and throughout uh, the U.S. Department of Energy Office of De Ener Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability has been the office that has uh, initiated and continued to fund the work. So the tool itself is publicly available. Um, there's a registration, so if you um, reach the home page, then uh, there is a register and a login um, link at the top right. And the purpose of logging in and registering is primarily for you to be able to save your work. Um, so there are quite a bit of results generated by the tool, and it will um, accumulate your results between sessions. The tool itself includes data, models, and reports, primarily in the mapping interface. And off the home page, which you can access without registering, is the policy information database, which is at the center of that upper bar at the top under policies and regs. So the tool itself is designed for a lot of um, fairly professional level uh, energy analysis uh, for the ICEPIC members, as well as these other categories, um, electric utilities and grid operators, non-government organizations, We've got quite a few folks that have registered from universities and some of these other categories. Um, we also have a lot of representation from other federal agencies besides uh, the Department of Energy. And we've had a fairly good response. Um, so you know, the added step of registering probably uh, discourages a casual user, so um, we may not um, there may be more interest than uh, reflected in the registration, but um, at least uh, 1,260 people have taken a step to register and try it out. The scope of the tool is at the lower right there in terms of energy. So each of these energy categories are low or no carbon. And uh, for coal, the assumption is that it'll have carbon capture and sequestration and uh, use some of the newer technologies and I won't be getting into a lot of the power plant models, but that's one of the major parts of the tool. And uh, all these different um, energy categories are represented with 
energy resource data, as well as models to help you um, decide what area on, in the study area might be most suitable for implementing certain technologies. Okay. Um, recent updates to the tool. I usually cover this on any demo. Um, so we'll be talking about today the climate cha change report, which is just added. Um, there was an option to run models as draft or final. And you see that uh, inter interface part uh, that circled there. Um, the purpose of that is, is that um, it's really a performance issue. So to, to help make the website more responsive, we have had the models running at a lower resolution um, but the data library is at a little higher resolution. So now with the switch added, you can choose to um, to have a faster run at lower resolution or a little bit slower run at higher resolution. And these models tend to run within, uh, I would say, 10 minutes, even if, if they're high resolution, and maybe a minute or two for low. Uh, we changed the base maps to Google Maps uh, recently. Um, we're trying that out, and um, there's a nice um, terrain map that's available in that set um, that has helped us a little bit with the problem we've been having, having with map registration. Um, we think that's fixed. It, it was kind of a low-level, very troublesome problem, um, and we're still uh, testing that out. And then we keep regular um, updates going for the mapping library. So the layers listed there are ones that have been recently updated. So again, today's focus is on um, the energy planning aspects of climate change. And um, that's one of our funded uh, tasks this year uh, with these three subcategories. So not just climate change, but um, adding data about power plant water use, and then adding data that's still being developed um, for water availability cost and future demand. Uh, so that will be coming um, shortly as an addition. Um, the climate change work was um, aided by the Energy Water Focus Team, which is um, a group of subject matter experts, um, both within Argonne and, and anyone who likes to participate. The real purpose of that group is to review our plans and the designs that, that we're working for this topic, to test the new capabilities, and to assist in any uh, data gathering methods and potential refinements that they're um, familiar with. Uh, the work is primarily based on the 2014 National Climate Assessment, and uh, there's a link to that report on the slide. So uh, as far as energy is concerned, uh, this slide goes over some of the key messages from the climate assessment, and I'm not going to belabor this slide, but uh, you can see the highlighted text, um, extreme weather events, higher summer temperatures um, or warmer winters um, and their effects on peak loads in the summer and energy demands for heating in the winter. Um, overall net energy use is projected to increase. Um, water availability is changing according to the climate models. Uh, sea level rise is another issue. Um, the work we are doing, or we have, have done, does not include some of the storm surge um, or high tide data, but it uh, takes elevations from the assumptions um, in the climate models about sea level rise and shows what areas might be impacted by that. And then, um, in general, future energy systems will differ from today's in, in various ways that aren't fully known yet. But um, surely the, in, the addition of wind and solar and other renewables is changing the grid. Um, and there are many other effects. For example, uh, power plant cooling may have to have new considerations based on climate change 
and there may be some new approaches to that implemented. Some of this is, um, gets complicated very quickly, so um, I'm not an expert in climate change. Uh, we do have some folks, very, very knowledgeable experts that have been assisting, and, um, and they've really uh, helped improve the um, defensibility and, and the quality of what, what's been done. So the group, um, we settled on many of these questions here. One is energy demand. How much capacity will we need in the future? And some of those are affected by the change in cooling degree days um, that are projected, as well as uh, just temperature change itself. Um, some of those are seasonal changes, and some of those are just kind of total number of cooling degree days. Um, and then as far as locating new power plants, there may be uh, trends in flood magnitudes, coastal areas with sea level rise, and stresses to water supply that would affect that. And that gets to be very complex, um, especially the water supply. Um, and then the amount of cooling water. Um, so for example, if um, you have hotter summers and you need to cool your plant, it may be less efficient if your um, if your water that you're using for cooling is already at a higher temperature. Um, so um, all these things interplay very in very complex ways. Okay, so this is a list of the data sets that um, have been added through this effort to the mapping tool. And um, I'll be showing you these, so I don't, I don't really need to read them for you. Um, and then I'll be showing you the climate report. Um, so here's a shot of it on the right of the full report, kind of in reduced form. And then uh, one part is on sea level rise is enlarged. So uh, just a comment about the design of the report. Uh, those text sections um, explain kind of the issues that are involved with that particular um, section and uh, take excerpts out of the um, National Climate Assessment and also link to the Climate Assessment document giving a page number where that topic appears. So we feel that it's it's got a pretty good means of helping you see um, the basis for the information in this report and, and what the rationale behind it is. And under each table is a link to the data source or sources that went into the actual numbers in the table. Um, those connect to metadata that we have in the tool, and you can consult that metadata to see exactly what data source um, those numbers are based on. Uh, the shading, it's kind of colorful. Um, it's intended to help bridge the mapping library with the report. So these colors match um, the layers that are used as inputs to the table. The colors are used on, in the map, and you can see the correlation between them when you work on the mapping tool. OK, um, so I'll uh, spend the rest of the time demonstrating the tool. And I usually mention that I keep the, the phones unmuted unless we have someone that puts us on hold and music starts playing. Um, please um, feel free to chime in, ask questions. Um, if there's something you don't understand, I'd, I'd rather stop and explain it than I would um, just to have, um, have me give a spiel the whole time. All right. Um, so first of all, here's the home page for the tool. Um, here's the link to the policies and regulations um, section. And you can, I've already logged in. But before you log in, there would be a login and a register link up here. Um, and then on any page, you can click the Launch Tool button to start up the tool. Um, one thing that I gloss over sometimes, but I want to always try to alert people to, is that either on the home page or within the tool, uh, there's quite a bit of help available to help learn how to use it or to potentially answer a question. Um, 
you can contact us directly and ask questions. Uh, we're, we're very um, happy to do that. There's a link right here on the home page to contact us. Um, there's a hard copy help manu manual. And then there's also a series of very short videos that illustrate how to use the different parts of the interface. So uh, we think that it's pretty easy to learn. And I won't explain every step of, of what I'm doing during the dem demonstration today um, because of that. OK, so I've already launched the tool. And anyone that's been using it will notice that the base maps, um, the default base map is changed here. So now you can switch between these four options. And um, the terrain map. Um, especially goes well with the uh, elevation data that we've recently been showing. Okay, so the, the map starts with uh, minimal map content. Um, I've preloaded many of these layers here that I'll be going over today. So you'll typically see the ice pick region boundary, which is re really the eastern interconnection boundary. Um, which is um, the area of concentration for the ice pick organization. And these analysis areas and corridors are used um, and saved for you as you work if you add those. So to access uh, data for the map, you click the library icon and you get this dialog. Many of the dialogs in the tool operate the same way. You've got a column of actions on the left with a tool tip that tells you uh, what you can do. Um, you can open up, usually, this section and get further details. And then uh, there are various columns. Uh, these columns can be sorted by clicking on them. Or there's a drop-down menu, and you can filter. So here I've got a filter I typed in earlier for flood. If I Type that in, check the box to filter on title. You can see here's the flood trends and flood magnitude layers um, that have been added to the tool. Um, I've got them in my table of contents, so I'm, I'm not going to add them. But uh, this green icon will add the layer to the map. So then we can clear that filter. Um, one way to to find the majority of climate layers that have been added is if you choose the climate category. And this category also includes things like the wind turbine um, capacity factor and power density, um, some of those types of layers. Um, you know, wind and solar has um, weather data, really, that is part of climate. And those data are kept in this category as well. All right. OK, so just going through these data sets, um, I want to show you them and explain a little bit about them. And um, first, uh, flood magnitude trends. Um, this is point information that is um, populated with information about uh, historical flood um, floods and um, some change per dec dec decade and statistics that are looking forward. Um, and any layer you can. Showing on the map, you can click the Identify tool. And if you choose it and click on one of the features on the map, you'll get database information about the thing you clicked on. Uh, so here's the change per decade for this particular point. And um, that's the main thing that it's being symbolized on. And then this is based on engaging stations. So you can get at, um, you know, identify which station it is and, and get at it. There's a location name. And um, so some of this is a little bit cryptic. Um, 
what you can do is right click on this and choose metadata and what that does is download a PDF and this PDF will will provide a lot more insight about what um, what's in the layer who created it um, how recently it was produced uh, what do the database fields mean um, etc if you're interested in having a copy of that data you can do that through the data library you click library find the layer and this icon here allows you to download a GIS shapefile containing the data um, along with that will be a readme file and in the readme file we recommend that you consult the metadata and look for the original source of the data instead of the copy that we have in our database. We do keep the database um, up to date and maintain it, um, but for example, if it's a national layer at this time, it will only be only the eastern portion will be included in this downloadable layer. Um, so there, there are reasons to go to the original source, both to be sure that you're getting the latest information. Um, and also that it's the complete data set. Um, sometimes we've added value to these data sets. Um, they might come as a spreadsheet or even a section of report. Uh, we have improved information and, and it may be advantageous for you to get a copy of what we've done. Uh, so in some cases uh, it would be worthwhile to, to take the copy from this data, database. But we want to facilitate data sharing, so that's why you can access most of the data in the tool in that way. Are there any questions so far? All right. So the cooling degree uh, data is in four layers and they're not that exciting to look at on the map. Um, you can also click on them and get a little bit more detail. Um, and um, they're distilled into the climate change reports. So these particular layers um, are, are more useful in reporting form than I think they are on the map. Um, but these are symbolized consistently with the National Climate Assessment and maps and figures to try to keep things consistent. And, um, and again, the metadata will point you to more information on how those were developed. One of the things about climate modeling is that there are a whole series of models and um, they're based on different assumptions. Um, so in the short title we have here, you see the time period that, that the cooling degree dates are calculated for, and you can see that they're based on two different climate models or, or groups of models that are summarized. So many of those decisions were made by the researchers in the National Climate Assessment and are based on you know, the quality of the models and, and how well they've been accepted by the scientific community. Um, that gets way beyond my level of expertise on climate change and also is fairly complicated, at least for me. All right, um, projected temperature change. Um, this is for the period of 2071 to 2099. Not too exciting, um, but it's uh, kind of a low resolution data set. If you click on it, you'll see that there are two models represented in the layer. So there's a B1 or the lower emissions model and the higher emissions, A2. Um, this is one, if you go to layer properties under styles, you can symbolize it by either model. So again, the, the colors here are coming from the National Climate Assessment and some of these higher values um, are in other regions of the country that are not within this extent. Okay, um, this particular data set is, is kind of distilled by us um, based on um, 
the sea level rise predictions in the um, uh, National Climate Assessment. So the projections are for year 2100, and each of these ranges, um, except for above 6.6 .6 feet, each of these ranges is associated with a, a different model based on different assumptions. So predicted sea level rise ranges from 0.66 feet to 6.6 .6 feet. And what we did here was we used uh, 10 meter resolution elevation data in these height ranges and symbolized the map according to those elevation ranges. So here in the uh, delta area um, of Louisiana, you can see some of those um, sea level. So the yellow area is between one and four feet above sea level. And um, that's what this data set contains. So you can peruse the coastline and, and get a sense of where these elevation ranges occur. You can also add some of the infrastructure layers, transmission, existing transmission lines. Um, so you can superimpose um, some of the infrastructure over this map and get a sense of what, um, what lines could potentially be um, at least of interest for this topic. All right. Um, I'll, I'll get to the report soon because a lot of the, the report distills a lot of this for you um, in a nice way. So um, I'll show you how the layer corresponds to the report content in the near in a few minutes. All right, the aqueduct water stress projection data, um, this is actually a very a deep data set with an, an extensive report um, about it. Uh, so this is by no means a simple effort. And a lot of the climate change research results in some pretty comprehensive data sets. So um, we are showing here water stress for a very specific time period and for a specific model or scenario and the future value associated with that. And they have characterized watersheds in these ranges. If a watershed is either arid or has low water use, there's greater error in the model or, a little, or more speculation. So those areas are shown in gray. And while they do have values from the model, they're not placed into these ranges. Um, let me show you an example of that. So if I click this, first of all, there's truckload of other variables in the layer. And you'll see a repeating set of patterns. So here's seasonal variability information, water demand, water stress, and water supply. So each of these watersheds is coded in those four categories times three time periods, times three models. And each one of those combinations has a set of values related to it, either a numeric value or a categorization like that. So if I go back to um, let's see, let's go to water stress, here's that arid and low water use. So the future value is 0.68. And that falls into this, this range of high. But because it's such a low water use or an arid area, um, they are separating out those, um, those categories. I'm not sure. We still need to add, I think, the, yeah. Um, we plan to symbolize it by some of the other um, values, but for now, we're just showing the one. Any of these layers, by the way, can be, the properties can be used to make them transparent. So you can, you can do that, and it's very advantageous for superimposing information together um, and to seeing the base map underneath. Um, 
if I put, uh, by the way, you know, this layer transmission line, any layer, you can change the order of things by dragging it. So um, you can make things transparent to be able to see them, or you can drag them on top of another layer, and that changes the drawing order. So here now the, the boundary is showing on top. So those are all different ways that you can make it a little easier to see what you're looking for on the map and combine information. Okay. All right. Um, pretty much everything I've shown you um, is directly based on the National Climate Assessment. Um, one of the things related to water stress in the eastern United States is water quality. So in the west, it's more typical to have constraints about water availability, these more arid areas and with water rights and things. In the east, water quality is more of a concern or that aspect of water is more prevalent when you're doing energy planning. And um, part of water quality is, is river temperature or you know the temperature of the water itself. Um, so the City of University of New York um, provided us a data set from some of their research. Again, this isn't this is new model information that's not in the National Climate Assessment, but it does relate to a data set that wasn't really available or yet um, analyzed. Um, so I'm just going to hit zoom to layer extent. So this is I think it's pretty interesting information. Um, what they've done is look at um, kind of the area with a, a five kilometer grid resolution and any water course that is in that cell is, is part of the model and they use power plant locations and, and information about um, those power plants to look at the effect of that power plant on river temperature downstream due to cooling. Um, so you can see the purple areas are higher temperatures Okay, so this is the annual average change in temperature um, above the baseline temperature that you would assume if, if there wasn't uh, the power plant cooling occurring. So um, they have monthly data. So if you click on any of these cells, you'll see a whole series of values. Um, so there are annual temperatures from 2000 to 2010 annual average, and then for every year and month, there's a time series for that full time range. Um, so if you were to get a copy of this data set, um, you could show to a particular extent a, a graph of, of um, change in temperature based on the power plants. Um, this isn't um, climate change information. This is looking back at a past time period and looking at trends and they're comparing that to observed um, measurements. Um, but in the future they plan to model um, um, potential future outcomes based on climate change assumptions and also to run the model for other regions of the country. So this is active research that's going on and some of their current results. All right, and this isn't yet represented in a report, but um, you know, uh, I'm thinking in terms of including it with the water use data um, in that uh, earlier category I mentioned, the power plant water use. All right, so um, to run a report in the system, um, you can draw an area on the map and store it. Those are called analysis areas. So if I click that on and zoom to the extent of the, the map, you can see I've defined a few of those um, over the course of using the tool. Um, and those are stored in the areas um, tool. Uh, so here's the ones I've created. I can run a report for one of these areas and I can do some other things like show them on the map and edit the title and things like that. If I want to create a new area, I can do so with this new analysis area button. So for example, if I choose one, maybe uh, so we'll click 
click here, uh, double click to finish. Um, so it's called Delta Area. So if I wanted to run the climate report for this area, I could create my analysis area. Click Run a Report. Go to the report list and choose climate change. There are 20 reports that you can choose from in the tool currently. And it's defaulted to my, my choice for the analysis area um, type and then delta areas being the particular analysis area. If you'd like, you can run um, these reports by state or by county without sketching in an area yourself. You can just use the boundaries that are already there. Uh, you can edit the title if you want and put some notes and then you click Launch Report. And close that. And then under Results, um, pretty much everything in the tool that runs in the background uh, is cataloged in the re re results. This operates just like the one I showed you for layers. It's got filters on it. So I've got lots of results that I've run previously. Um, if I want to find things quickly, I can either sort by the creation date. So my latest run is at the top or I can filter by keyword. So right now that report's running. And then um, I've run some previous ones. So um, let me just start showing you some of those. So here's, here's the climate report for Alabama, the entire state. So there's a standard section at the top that describes the area that was used for analysis. And then um, there's an introductory section. So you click this link, it will send you to the National Climate Assessment. And you can see that um, you know, a lot of this um, discussion is, is centered on pages 115 and 116 of that report. Um, so for the state of Alabama, uh, projected temperature change in cooling degree days Again, these shades are based on the map layer shadings, and these links are pointing to metadata for the, the table inputs. So based on the higher emissions model, um, this 30-year period is expected to have 258.3 more um, cooling degree days as compared to the, the time period of 1971 to 1999. Um, and then um, over here, um, period of 2070 to 2099 is shown. And there's 784.7 days that are projected based on the higher emissions assumption. And then from different layer, the projected annual temperature change in degrees Celsius is about 3.9 degrees or 2.1, depending on, on which climate model you're looking at. So there are all kinds of energy planning implications of that that were kind of mentioned earlier. Um, but that would involve maybe the expected temperature of cooling water or the, the demand in electricity for, um, you know, for cooling um, and many other, even, even the design of transmission lines and how much they sag is partly based on temperature and load. So um, there are all kinds of complex ways that these values and, and this information can lend itself for planning. OK, for sea level rise, um, the first columns tell you, uh, for the area I sketched, about 47% is within the ocean sea level there. Just by the way, I sketched it. Um, and it gives you a percentage I'm sorry, 47 square miles, miles but only 0.1% um, of the analysis area. Um, and then, um, so you just get a sense of how much of your area is within different elevation ranges. And then we've processed a whole series of other data sets to tell you uh, what's going on within that area. So it looks like they haven't cited any uh, major power plants 
in that area that are below 6.6 .6 feet. Um, but there are 86 power plants in my analysis area with the total um, operating capacity of 35,000 megawatts. Um, and then there are you know, 18,000 transmission line miles, of which um, some of them are at very low elevations, as well as pipelines um, and substations. Um, the substations are not at those low elevations. So it gives you a pretty quick breakdown of what infrastructure might be at different levels of risk based on its um, sea level, um, elevation above sea level. Okay, so water stress, um, again, that was that multi-dimensional data set. So here are the three decades, and then here are the three models, business as usual, optimistic, and pessimistic. And then um, the gray is what percent of that area is in that, that special gray category. So in this region, there aren't any arid or low water use um, watersheds. So 100% is in, in some, some category of water use and in the delta area um, there isn't a significant predicted water stress. Um, not too surprising. Um, so it's in the low category. Um, and even flood magnitude trends in this area um, are below percent change per decade is, is uh, decreasing um, from the 1920s to 2008 uh, for this particular region. So that kind of gives you a, a detailed view of these reports. Um, let me just show you a few of the others. Um, okay, the Delta one's still running there. Let's see here. Typically, it'll run within minutes, so I'm not quite sure what's happening with that one. Um, but I have some prior runs. Looks, um, you know, something completely different. Kansas, uh, inland state. Um, here we have um, a little bit higher projected annual temperature change. Um, by the way, what it does there is it samples all the data within the state, and this is an average that's computed from that layer. So there are quite a few different um, cells that comprise that. And if you're interested in a very specific location, you can just uh, click on the map and get those layers directly. Not surprising, um, Kansas is not um, close to sea level, so everything is in this above 6.6 .6 feet category. Um, but interestingly, um, it looks like uh, 15,000 megawatts of power generation are in Kansas. Um, then um, there are other reports on power plants too, so I, um, I'm just showing you the climate change one right now. Okay, water stress in this area, it doesn't have any of the arid sections, but it, um, it's in the medium high level for all the different um, models and time periods for water stress. And then here, uh, percent change uh, for flood magnitude events are increasing over the 1920s to 2008 by 11%. You can kind of see the, the general trend here of uh, the, the information. Okay, um, let's look at Rhode Island. Okay, so it has a little bit less coastal area than um, the delta area, but um, you can see that there's there's a little bit of infrastructure that's pretty close to sea level, and, um, and as far as water stress, again, it's low to medium, not real, real significant there. And there weren't any results found for flood magnitude data, and that just means that there weren't any samples in that um, footprint. Um, so if we if we just take a look at Rhode Island, where are you? 
So um, you can follow up with that and show the, the map. So this corresponds to the um, colors in the report there. And again, if you say you wanted to superimpose the transmission lines, um, the categorization in the report is greater than or equal to 115 kV. The default in the tool is only to show down to 220. But if you right click on properties and pick um, by category, it'll add all the categories and you can see some of the ones that would be in the lower, you know, lower elevations. Okay, um, that's kind of a snapshot of the, the data, the topic, and the way the climate report works in the tool. And um, I think uh, the rest is really um, gets down to analyzing a particular area and thinking about the implications it has for whatever you might be planning or analyzing related to this topic. Um, so I just I guess I'll just stop there and um, give you some time to either ask questions or to um, go back to whatever you're working on. So are there any questions? All right. I'll stay in the line if there are any questions. Um, and but just to to finish up, um, the uh, the tool is available at this URL, um, icepicktools.anl.gov. Uh, we post um, future webinar dates on the homepage once they're scheduled, and we send monthly newsletters. Um, so we just recently sent one of those out. Um, there'll be another one coming up next month um, to finish off the fiscal year. And um, if you register for the tool and click uh, the box that says you're interested in updates, then we'll send you the newsletter. Otherwise, we um, you can register without getting that uh, newsletter if you don't want it. And then we're we're here at uh, icepicktools.anl.gov to answer any questions you have or if you encounter bugs with system or if you have suggestions for enhancements, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. So again, thank you for participating today and um, I will stay in the line for questions if you have any. All right, well, thanks again, and um, please uh, watch for the next webinar. The topic is going to be um, water energy issues in general, so I'll be uh, featuring uh, some of the other data and a little bit more on water energy topics, including some of the, the planned work for next year. All right, thanks again.